Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In her often anthologized essay, Trying Out One's New Sword, Mary Midgley points out a number of different objections, and I've tallied them up as really falling into seven different headings that have to do with the type of ethical or cultural relativism that she is labeling as um, moral isolationism or, you know, you could call it cultural isolationism as well. The general idea behind this is that because we don't really understand other cultures. We can only understand our own culture. We shouldn't make any sort of judgments about what's considered right or wrong in those cultures. And she uses the example of a samurai practice of trying out one's new sword by cutting a random person in half that one would happen to meet after forging the sword. Uh, this is something that there's a word for in the Japanese language, and we say, oh, that's a terrible thing. But she's saying that the moral isolationists would say, well, we don't really understand Japanese culture, so we should keep our hands off and don't make any judgments about that. And that leads to a lot of problems. And this, this is a relativistic position. We could expand it further and apply these remarks not just to cultural relativism, but to ethical relativism more broadly, where people are saying, listen, you don't come from the same background as me. You're not the same ethnicity. You're not the same gender. You haven't endured the same class struggles or racial struggles or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore, you can't make any judgments about what you know I'm saying, doing, going through, or you can't make any judgments about what those people over there there are doing. You know, you're not trans, so you can't say anything about the trans community or practices or, or things like that, just as one, you know, particularly timely example. Now, as I pointed out, Midgley thinks that there's some serious problems with taking this sort of position. The first thing that she points out is that people from other cultures don't actually follow this rule of the cultural anthropologists or the cultural relativists, and they do criticize other cultures very often, quite vociferously, and uh, sometimes, you know, we, we even take what they're saying as, as being on top of things or right. So she says, does the isolating barrier between cultures work both ways? Are people in other cultures equally unable to criticize us? And she brings up an example of an article in The Guardian, and we can multiply examples like this, where a uh, South American Indian was taken into a Brazilian town for an operation. It saved his life. When he came back to his village, he made several highly critical remarks about the white Brazilian's way of life. And she says they may have well been justified, but the interesting point was that the anthropologist called these remarks, quote, a damning indictment of Western civilization. She says, now the, the Indian was in that town for two weeks. Was he in a position to deliver a damning indictment? If we're going to say so, then we should be prepared to let other people deliver damning indictments too, like, say, Western tourists going and living in some place for two weeks. They may be off base. They may not have enough of a... a uh, you know, range of experiences. They may have talked to the wrong people, but we shouldn't preclude the very possibility of making judgments given that we let other people do that. And other cultures not only make those judgments about our Western culture, late modern, et cetera, urbanized, they also make that about all sorts of other cultures. All you have to do is look through the literature of history and you will find almost every single culture being ethnocentric in that way. 
Another point that she makes is that if we cannot blame or criticize, that also rules out the very possibility of praising or justifying. So if we want to say that, um, you know, we, we shouldn't say anything bad about samurai culture and its uh, willingness to allow strangers to be attacked and killed in order to test out a piece of equipment, then we also can't praise the Japanese for the wonderful spirituality shown in the tea ceremony because we equally don't understand that any more than we would the other customs. So that's an important thing. If you, if you want to be able to praise or justify, you have to then also have the possibility of blaming or criticizing. She says, certainly we may need to praise things which we don't fully understand. We say there's something very good here, but I can't make it out yet. This is what leads us to learn from strangers. A third point that she makes is that if we take this standpoint of moral isolationism, we, became, we become unable to even effectively judge our own culture. Why? In part because if the, the, the argument here is we don't understand the practices of others, we don't understand the culture of others, therefore we must not make any judgments about it, there's many things in our own culture that are rather obscure or mysterious to us. Think about, you know, traffic, uh, foot traffic, pedestrian traffic, biking, uh, driving around. A lot of the rules seem really arbitrary and confusing. You know, we may not have learned all of them completely. How many of you, when you drive, have the rules of the road of your state or country or whatever it happens to be in your glove box, handy to consult when you need to? When you get to a four-way stop, do you know who should go first, who has right of way? Oh, if not, then you have to be quiet. You can't make any judgments whatsoever. Well, that's a little ridiculous, isn't it? The other thing she points out with this as well, when it comes to judging our own culture, is that if we can't understand anything about other cultures, that makes it very hard for us to make judgments about our own because we use other cultures as points of comparison. If we say, for example, here in the United States, we're still having big debates about universal health care and whether, whether that will ever be a possibility or if putting it into practice would be intolerable uh, tyranny or destroy the economy. If we can't look at you know, other places that do, in fact, have universal health care and do quite fine with it and nobody makes a fuss about it other than a few blowhards, if we can't look at that and say, well, it seems to make sense over there, we're unable to use that as a point of comparison to our own culture. We, we also can't do that for things that we think we're getting right. We can't say, you know, we're actually doing better when it comes to human rights than, say, Russia, you know, or uh, some other places. Um, so it's important that we be able to judge other cultures if we want to be able to judge our own culture. She also talks about a sort of inconsistency of moral judgment that is involved in moral isolationism. And she's got a really interesting comparison here. She says, um, you know, we can no more afford to put moralizing out of business than smugglers can afford to abolish custom regulations. The power of moral judgment is, in fact, not a luxury, not a perverse indulgence of the self-righteous. It is a necessity. When we judge something to be bad or good, better or worse than something else, we're taking it as an example to aim or avoid. So um, why then do we get worked up about people making judgments of other cultures? For example, why do we not like the ugly American tourist heading into, say, a Portuguese cafe and demanding that the waiter do exactly what, you know, somebody at the Olive Garden would be doing <laughs> for them, right? So she, she goes out and she says, um, you know, what happens is, you know, our, our, our involvement in moral isolationism does not flow from apathy, from moral skepticism but from a rather acute concern about human hypocrisy and other forms of wickedness. But we polarize that concern around a few selected moral truths. We're rightly angry with those who despise, oppress, or steamroll other cultures. We think that doing these things is actually wrong, but here's where the inconsistency arises. This itself is a moral judgment. 
We, sh we could not condemn oppression and insolence if we thought that all our condemnations were just a trivial local quirk of our own culture. We could do it still less if we tried to stop judging altogether. So she's not saying that, that you know, it's, it's not good to stand up for other cultures, particularly against those who are wrongly criticizing them. But we don't have to accept isolationism as the means by which we will do that. Another thing that she points out is that if we want to defend another culture or justify it or praise it, we do, in fact, have to have some understanding of it. And she, she gives you this example of somebody who is justifying the samurai practice and saying, um, you know, they'll fill in the background, make me understand the custom, explaining the exalted ideals of discipline and devotion, which produced it, and go on and go on and go on. She says, an objector who talks like this is implying it is possible to understand alien customs. Why? Because that is what that person's action is. That's the speech act that they're engaged in. They're trying to get me to see things their way. And again, this could apply not just to different cultures. This could apply to whatever divisions we want to set up where we say that, you know, this is a privileged epistemological standpoint. You from the outside can't possibly understand it and participate within it. Well, if you're going to defend it, you're asking somebody to join in on that standpoint. Another uh, interesting objection that she, she raises that I think is really on point is that if we don't apply moral truths, if we don't um, you know, apply what we actually believe about what is good, what is bad, what is wrong, what is right, if we don't do that, then we're actually treating other people and other cultures as less than human. We're not taking them seriously. We're treating them as if they're lacking something or as if they're, you might say, a kind of joke. Um, so that, that's, a, I think, that quite a, a big problem itself. If we want to think that we're being respectful of other cultures, we have to be willing to apply some sort of standards that, that go between our cultures and overarch them as well. The last thing that she points out is that historically, this is kind of nonsense. There is no isolating barrier of this sort. If there really was, if cultures could not communicate with each other, we would not have any history at all because human groups would never have been able to communicate and interact successfully with each other. And we wouldn't have the culture that we have within which cultural relativism could actually seem like a good thing. She says, our culture is no sealed box, but a fertile jungle of different influences. Greek, Ju Jewish, Roman, Norse, Celtic, and so forth, into which further influences are still pouring. American, Indian, Japanese, Jamaican, you name it. She's talking from the standpoint of a, a British person. And she says, the moral isolationist picture of separate, unmixable cultures is unreal. People who talk about British history usually stress the value of this fertilizing mix. But this is not an odd fact about Britain, except for the very smallest and most remote all cultures are formed out of many streams. All have the problem of digesting and assimilating things, which at the start they do not understand. All have the choice of learning something from this challenge or alternatively refusing to learn and fighting it mindlessly instead. If we use the example of Japanese culture that she began with, that is an incredibly hybrid culture that is still in the process of assimilating aspects from other cultures even today. So to say that, oh, we can't possibly understand the Japanese standpoint because we're not Japanese or not, you know, if somebody is saying that Japanese American, not Japanese enough or something along those lines, that's nonsense. Every single culture takes in aspects and elements from other cultures, oftentimes borrowing these things unconsciously. And so there really is no isolating barrier of the sort that she's, she's talking about. So these are seven main 
arguments or objections to this type of moral isolationism that is often associated with cultural relativism, but can also apply to other epistemological positions as well that hold that unless you belong to a certain group or class or gender or whatever other designator you wish to have, you cannot possibly make moral judgments about the practices, beliefs, sayings, any of those things of those particular people. That's a form of ethical relativism that's very similar to cultural relativism, treating those things as if they were cultures. And the moral isolationism that they lead to is seen now as very problematic for all these reasons.